Okay, um, thanks. So, so yes, so what I want to talk about today um, is essentially, you know, gauge invariance and, <coughs> and renormalization. Um, and so remember, well, so maybe what I want to do first is to, to just give you some kind of statement. I don't want to make a super precise mathematical statement, but I want to just give you a statement of this, the type of statement uh, which we're going to use in the proof. And so we essentially take the whole regularity structure business as a black box. So I'm not going to talk at all about you know, regularity structures or anything. I'm just going to take a sort of black box statement, which is just a convergence statement um, about regularized solutions. So, so the general setting is so of the following type. Um, well, you want to try to define uh, solutions and part of the problem is to figure out what solution means to equation of the following type, um, say DTU equal Laplacian U and then plus some nonlinearity, which might depend on U, maybe on the derivative of U um, and on some noise, okay? Um, and here, this is quite general. So in principle, even the Laplacian doesn't need to be a Laplacian, it could be Laplacian square or something. Uh, U doesn't need to be scalar valued. So in our case, it would be, it would take values into linear maps from RD into the Lie algebra G, right? But it has to take values in some linear space. Um, and the important assumption here is that the nonlinearity is local in the sense that it's not, so when I write F of U, it doesn't mean view u as an element in some Hilbert space and then take a function from that Hilbert space into some other space. Uh, it really means, you know, take a function from whatever, Rn to Rn or something and then just compose u with that function, right? So it means that f of u at some point x is really just some function applied to u of x, right? So it's really just a composition operator, uh, but it might, like here, it might depend, for example, on the derivatives of u. Um, and the noise comes in, so in our case, the noise comes in sort of additively, uh, but in general, again, depending on the regularity of the solution and so on, you could have multiplicative terms and so on. Um, now, the general, so the main assumption always is that um, f, is subcritical. And again, there's a, so morally what it means is what we already discussed a couple of times, which is to sort of, you look at descaling that leaves the linearized equation invariant and you sort of zoom in and you would want the nonlinear terms to be small. Um, here I wrote things in a quite general way. So there is actually a definition that works in this kind of general framework. Okay, so it's just about certain derivatives of f being zero, basically. Um, and then let me write for, say, uh, write u epsilon of f uh, for the map that maps say an initial condition into the law of the solution, but with psi replaced by some mollification, right? So psi epsilon, and here again, it's quite general, right? So I don't want to be super precise in what I mean by mollification. Um, and you could in principle also even regularize the equation in a slightly different way and similar kind of statements would be true. Um, but 
so just about notation, right? So here the U, so one thing which is quite important in this business is I keep track on how it actually depends on the nonlinearity because I want to actually, so randomization is all about actually changing the nonlinearity um, as epsilon is small. So I want to keep track of the dependence of the nonlinearity. And then for a given nonlinearity, what U epsilon does is that it just spits out like the solution map. Um, but here in this talk, I want to actually just keep track of the law of the solution. Okay, not, so I don't want to interpret the solution as being like something pathwise. Um, it does also give you a pathwise solution in the end. Okay, but I don't want to exploit that. So I want to just keep track of the law of the solution. Um, and that's going to be the reason why I'm going to keep track of the law is because later on we're going to see, we're going to basically make like equivalent changes of measures under which the law doesn't change, but the pathwise description would change. Um, and so I want to only keep track of the law. Um, okay, and now what you want is the, you know, the question is whether this guy converges to a limit, right? Does epsilon goes to zero. And of course you can put some sort of topology on this space, right? So it's a kind of space of solution maps or space of solution theories. And you can put some sort of topology on it. You can also put a topology here on the space of nonlinearities. And you know, pretty much any kind of reasonable topology would work. Um, and so then the kind of statement that you have, so I write it as a theorem in quotation mark. And the only reason why there are quotation marks is because the statement is not precise, right? Uh, but it is, a, there are real theorems to that effect, but there are several, you know, not completely equivalent, but all very similar kind of formulations, depending on what you want to assume exactly. Um, and it sort of tells you something like this. So there exists a finite number of uh, counter terms and a counter term, say G, G tau, so the tau is an index here that only takes finitely many values. And the counter term is something of the same type as the nonlinearity, okay? So it's the sort of thing that you would want to put in the right-hand side of the equation. So it's a function of U of U and the gradient possibly. Um, and constants C epsilon tau such that if you if you take epsilon to zero but what you do is you change f so you add to f these counter terms so there's a sum of a tau implicit here okay so that this limit exists um, is independent of the mollification. And furthermore, um, it is continuous oops, in F. Okay. So, so it so you get some notion of solution. So you can then call this, if you want the solution to your equation. Um, but you see that the way you've obtained the solution is not by actually solving the original equation and then just sending epsilon to zero, but it's by solving a modified equation uh, where you add some term to the right-hand side. Um, and in principle, there's an explicit description description of the G tiles um, and there's an explicit formula for the constant C epsilon tiles. Um, and the important thing, we're not really going to make use much of this explicit description. Uh, the important thing is that the G tiles are of 
in a way uh, lower order. than f. Okay, so what I mean by lower order is really that, you know, typically the f is going to be a polynomial in u and gradient u. So in our case, we've seen the equation that we're interested in uh, is the stochastic Young-Mills equation. So if I can find it, um, the equation was, oh, where is it? This. Okay, so here we wrote it down. So the u would be the ais, right? so the collection of all the ais, um, and then the f, the nonlinearity, would be this whole term here. Right? And so you see that this, at the end of the day, it's really just a polynomial of degree three uh, in a and its derivative. Right? It's of degree one in the derivative and degree three in a itself. Okay, so typically the f is actually just a polynomial. Um, and the G's are polynomials of kind of lower degree. And there's a way of obtaining the, the G's from F. Okay, so, so now what does this tell us in our case? All right, so in our case, um, In our case, the equation is of the following form, dTA equal to Laplacian A. And then I don't write the exact form of the equation, but the point is that there's one term which is sort of bilinear in A and its derivatives. And there's another term which is sort of trilinear in A, uh, and then there's a noise term. Okay, so the equation essentially looks like this uh, for some you know, for a suitable definition of this bilinear form and this trilinear form here, okay? So, um, now what does this um, general sort of black box tells us? Well, now it tells us that you have, if you want to get a solution to this equation, you would in general have to add counter terms and the counter terms have to be of lower order, right? So a priori, need to add counter terms of lower order. Uh, and that means, well, there's four types of counter terms. So they are the ones that are essentially like constants. They are the ones that are proportional to A. They are the ones that are proportional to A square. And then there are ones that are proportional to derivative of A, right? So that's essentially the polynomials. So, right, so since I have something of degree three in A, so lower order would be degree two, one, or zero. And I have something of degree two in A and derivative of A. And so what's of lower order would be degree one, which means either just the A or just A itself. Right? Um, well, of course, what this means here, right, so since A takes values in a rather large vector space, right, so A takes values in uh, linear maps from either R2 or R3 into the Lie algebra of our group G. Um, and therefore, what this means here is that, well, a constant is really a constant of that rather large space that A takes values in. Here, it would mean that you have a counter term with a, which is of the form, you know, some linear operator applied to A. Here you have some bilinear map applied to A, and here you have again some kind of linear map applied to derivative of A. Okay, so a priori there are lots of degrees of freedom here. Um, and now what we want to do is we want to reduce so hey Martin, there was a yes. question in the chat oh, just uh, by the way. Oh, sorry, I didn't actually keep the chat open, so I don't see that. Uh, where is the chat? Yes, could you give a heuristic description of the nonlinear? Oh, uh, I did that already. No, I showed the equation. Oh, what do you mean by a heuristic description? Like, 
I'm not completely sure what the what the question means. So I, I just showed the equation again. Um, I oh like the physical meaning of the term. Well, I think I spent somehow the first two lectures somehow discussing that, right? So I don't think I'm going to go back to that. Um, okay. Um, so so now what we want to see is how you can use symmetries. Uh, to reduce that freedom by a lot, okay? And I claim that you can actually, if you want to exploit, if you want to really impose gauge invariance, the claim is that there is exactly one way uh, to renormalize the equation um, that actually respects gauge invariance. Okay, so the thing, so just one remark, right? Here, what this tells you, this theorem, is that of course, there isn't like a unique notion of solution, right? Because if, um, if one bunch of constants here gives you a limit with all of these properties, then you know, just adding some fixed number to any of these constants still gives you a limit you know, with essentially the same properties. Uh, and it just corresponds to sort of changing F in a way. Okay, but there's no natural reference Right, so there's no claim here that this choice of constants is unique. Okay, so you can always somehow add some finite values to them uh, and all the properties that I mentioned will still be true. Okay, uh, so there's a lot of freedom here. So once you've chosen which one you call the solution, then solutions are unique in a way. Uh, in the sense that, for example, here you have this sort of independence of mollification and so on. So things are relatively robust, um, but there is a lot of freedom. So there is this freedom in choosing, in a way, the finite parts of all of these constants. Right? And uh, the claim is going to be that, so the main result I want to talk about today um, is the fact that it's possible to choose these constants in such a way that gauge invariance holds. And furthermore, there's actually a unique way of choosing them, right? So, the, so in this particular case, in this case of pure Young-Mills, what we call the solution, if we want to impose gauge invariance, it's completely determined. Even though a priori, we have enormous degrees of freedom, right? So we have all like this operate, this element, this linear map, this bilinear map, and this linear map, that's all degrees of freedom of the randomization procedure. And the claim is that gauge invariance fixes all of these degrees of freedom uniquely. Okay. So um, we're going to purely reason sort of by symmetries. Okay, so in principle, you have explicit formulas. So in two dimensions, uh, you can actually kind of check things by hand. Uh, in two dimensions, the formulas are sufficiently tractable uh, that you can actually just check which ones of these constants are equal or zero and so on. In three dimensions, the formulas become so horrible that it's completely untractable. Okay, so it's not just that you have tons of degrees of freedom, but each of these constants actually is itself made up of like literally dozens of terms and each term is a huge multiple integral of various heat kernels and stuff. Okay, so it's completely untractable. Uh, and so we're only going to reason by symmetries. So, Martin? yes. There's another question. In oh yeah, there's another question. Uh, normally when I see a Lie bracket, it means that the filomorphic operator, this isn't the case here. Um, no, no, the, the Lie bracket is perfectly normal. Lie bracket. So the Lie bracket here is, so it's, it's Lie bracket in the Lie algebra, right? So it's actually just, a, the Lie algebra is a finite dimensional vector space. Uh, the Lie bracket is the Lie bracket on that Lie algebra, which comes from the, the group operation of G. So it's just a bilinear operation on a finite dimensional vector space. Okay, so it's not an abstract, it's a completely, it's a very concrete object, the Lie bracket, right? Because you should think of, it's not, again, it's sort of pointwise thing. So you should think, think of A, especially when I smoothen things out, right? So when I smoothen things out, if I put an epsilon here, uh, the solutions are actually smooth, right? And so A is a smooth function from space time into, uh, so A, at least A epsilon, 
would be a smooth function from R times TD into uh, linear maps from RD into the Lie algebra, right? So it's one form. So this is basically what it means to be a one form here. Um, this is completely finite dimensional, okay? And the Lie bracket just acts here. So when we write things like AI bracket AJ, this really means you take AI of X and T and AJ of X and T, and then you take the Lie bracket here, right? The I just means you take the I component in RD here, uh, and then the Lie bracket is the Lie bracket in G, which is just you know some fixed bilinear operation on a finite dimensional vector space, okay? So there's nothing very abstract here. It's super concrete. Um, okay, so the first symmetry I want to use here is the following very simple remark um, that this equation here is unchanged under the operation that maps x to minus x and a to minus a both simultaneously, right? Because if I do that, what happens? So you see that that guy changes sign. That guy also changes sign because A changes sign. And then you have one derivative that makes you, gives you another sign change, but then you have a second derivative. So it gives you a third sign change. So at the end of the day, you've just changed sign. Here again, because you change sign once for that A, once for that A, and then once for that X derivative. So that's three times. Here again, you change sign three times. Uh, and then this is white noise. So changing its sign or not, well, it doesn't make any difference, right? So it's kind of equal in law to minus itself. So at least in law, the equation is unchanged under making this substitution. Um, and that sort of immediately tells you that the counter terms that you're going to get, well, they should also respect uh, that symmetry, right? So I mean, at least intuitively, it's pretty clear, right? So it, would be, it would be quite weird uh, that you would have to somehow break a symmetry, a sort of simple symmetry like that in order to get a limit. And you can actually, there's sort of a theorem to that effect. Um, so this tells you that the counter terms should also be counter terms. They should uh, preserve this. Um, and so out of these counter terms, you see that the only one that has the right property is that one, right? Because that, that one changes sign, but all of these don't change sign. Right? Because that changes sign twice, that one changes sign twice, and that one just doesn't change sign at all. Right? So, so the only counter term is that one. Um, and then furthermore, you can, there's a sort of permutation under the components, right? So the AI, in some sense, the index I, the specific value of the index I never really played any role. I can sort of permute the space coordinates. It doesn't make any difference. Um, so if you use furthermore that sort of symmetries or, or you know, this is also something you can see by just looking at the explicit expressions for these constants, um, then what you find is that at the end of the day, uh, the counter terms, the only counter terms of the form, so counter terms, of the form um, C epsilon, say, AI, right? So in the sense that uh, if I look at the equation, right, so the equation I can write it as DT AI equal to, well, the whole equation we had. And then the claim is that you would have to add a counter term of this form where this guy is some linear map from G to G, right? Uh, and it would have to be the same for all the indices I because they all play exactly the same role. Right? 
Um, okay, so now we've re reduced it to this. We still have quite a lot of degrees of freedom, right? So we still have a whole sort of linear map from G to G uh, as a degree of freedom. And so what I want to argue now is that we can reduce ourselves to the situation where this linear map is forced to be a constant actually. So uh, just multiple of the identity. Mm. So how do we do this? Um, well, the first thing is that from now on, um, so from now on, we're going to assume that G is simple. Um, and you can, you know, that is basically not much uh, loss of generality because we've always assumed that G is compact uh, and basically a compact Lie group, we can always kind of factor it into simple Lie groups. Okay, so there's no, there's no real loss of generality. In Sorry, what is a that, simple group? Uh, so a simple group is, well, basically one that you can't factor anymore. <laughs> Um, so, but, the, okay, but the property that we're going to use of, of simple compact Lie groups um, is the following. So this is a sort of not completely trivial fact. It doesn't immediately follow from the definitions, okay, but it's a theorem um, proposition, if you want, um, is that if you have a linear map say, I don't know, L from G to G, such that um, the commutator between add G and L is zero for every G in G, then L is equal to lambda times identity for some lambda in R. Okay, so, so that's a consequence of simple Lie groups is that you, you do not have, okay, so one consequence is that you don't have any subspaces of the Lie algebra that are non-trivial and that are kind of invariant under uh, the adjoint operation on the conjugation with elements in G. Okay? Um, and from this, you can deduce that you have this property here. Okay, so there's a subtlety here because when you look at the statements, there are some things that look at the Lie algebra, some of them look at the complexification of the Lie algebra and the two statements don't quite work together. Uh, but then there's actually a theorem that tells you that in the case where G is compact and simple, then the two actually work together in the right way uh, and you get that proposition. Okay, so it tells you that if you have a linear map from the Lie algebra to itself, which commutes with all of these adjoint operations or with conjugation by uh, any element of capital G, then that linear map has to be a multiple of the identity. Okay? And so what we want to do now is to exploit this fact in order to deduce from that, that this constant here has to be a multiple of the identity, or at least Sorry, it doesn't have to be a multiple of the identity, but we're able to choose it in such a way that it's a multiple of the identity. So it's divergent part, if you want, has to be a multiple of the identity. Okay. So, um, so the theorem that I want to show you now is um, there exists some C hat epsilon. So did I write the epsilon as a subscript or superscript? Yeah. There exists C hat epsilon such that the limit as epsilon goes to zero of C epsilon 
minus c hat or oh, c epsilon minus c hat epsilon. This limit exists. Um, and furthermore, c hat epsilon has this property, which is that it commutes with all of these conjugation operators. And therefore, in particular, it's a multiple of the identity. Um, so how do we show this? Um, so first I, well, I'm going to fix G. So actually what I'm going to do um, is I'm basically going to just show this for a fixed G. Right, so I'm going to basically fix the G and then show that for that fixed G, uh, this statement is true. But then if it's true for a fixed G, you can, you know, like the subspace, this is, these guys live in a finite dimensional vector space, right? So the space of linear maps, for, this is finite dimensional. So linear maps from this to itself, it's just the space of matrices. So that's a finite dimensional vector space. Uh, the set of linear operators that commute with this guy for some specific G, that's just a linear subspace. Uh, and the claim here is that the intersection of all of these linear subspaces is one dimensional and it's just, you know, spanned by the identity matrix, okay? Um, and so now what this tells you, right, is that if you take, so if you can show this statement for one specific G, but arbitrary, right, what does it tell you? So let me, let me try to do some sort of a picture, but maybe I don't have enough dimensions on the, uh, on the board to draw a picture, <laughs> but you know, so there's a there's a one-dimensional space, right, which is the sort of lambda times identity. Okay, so here the board is the linear maps from G to G. Okay? So I have this one-dimensional space, which is a lambda times identity. And what I want to do is I want to show that. So maybe I should sort of draw the picture from the top so that this one dimensional space is like a point. Um, okay, so I have a one dimensional space, but which I draw as a zero dimensional space. Uh, and that's just the lambda times identity. And I want to show that um, as epsilon goes to zero, the C hat epsilon sort of converge to something, well, they themselves, so the C epsilons don't converge, so they would diverge as epsilon goes to zero. But if I just look at the, the claim is that they only diverge in this direction, right? So in a way, if I look at it from the top, uh, so that this one dimensional subspace gets kind of squashed to a point, uh, then the claim is that it looks like they converge, right? But of course, in reality, they really di diverge sort of along that subspace, right? So what you really want to show is that your C epsilons viewed from the top sort of converge to a finite limit here. Um, and now the claim is that if you can show us, so now if you fix a G on the other hand, uh, then you get a larger subspace, which I'm going to draw as like a two dimensional thing, right? So this would be the set of L's so that L commutes with add G but for some fixed G, not for all Gs, okay? So then now that gives me also a subspace of my space of matrices, but it's kind of a larger subspace. So it's not just one dimensional. And the intersection, so if I take a different G, then I maybe get this one, right? And the intersection between all of these spaces is just that one dimensional space, okay? That's kind of the geometric picture here. Um, and if I can, right? So if I can show that, this statement is true for any one fixed little g, then the claim is that it really has to be true for all g's simultaneously. Because you see, if it's true for, for example, this particular g, the one that's 
for which I've drawn the corresponding subspace as a solid uh, red line. What does it tell me? It tells me that um, if I look at my C epsilons, so that's my C epsilons uh, for, fixed, for different epsilons, well, they might sort of diverge, but they diverge sort of in the direction. So they would stay within a fixed neighborhood of that subspace, right, as epsilon goes to zero. So there's like a fixed neighborhood of this subspace, um, and they would stay in that fixed neighborhood. But if this is true for any fixed G, right, so that means you stay in a fixed neighborhood of that guy, uh, but you also stay in a fixed neighborhood for that guy and for the other guys and so on, right? And at the end of the day, that actually tells you that you really have to stay in a fixed neighborhood of the intersection. Uh, and that basically gives you the statement that you want. Okay, so, so at least that so geometric picture uh, makes it relatively clear that we just need to prove that statement for a fixed G. And if we can prove it for a fixed but arbitrary G, then we can also prove it for all G simultaneously. Martin? Yes. It was a cl just clarification from the chat that this uh, Lie bracket with the, um, it is uh, zero for all epsilon, right? Uh, uh, yes, that's right. Yeah, 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 so that's uniformly in epsilon. So, okay. Um, now, now the only thing that we're going to, so one thing that we're going to exploit is, um, oh yeah, so first maybe I should give that space a name. So let me call this PG. Uh, so PG is just the set of matrices that commute with at G for that specific G, okay? Um, so now the idea is to consider the equation TTA is equal to, you know, our young mills, but instead of just putting a Xi here, I put sigma times psi, okay? So I change the strength of the noise, okay? I don't change the equation. I don't change anything else of the, in the equation, but I keep track of the strength of the noise, okay? So I'm going to denote this, uh, of course, so let me just denote it to be consistent with previous notation. So let me keep the delta A here. And then this whole thing, uh, let me denote it by F sigma, okay? And of course, so F sigma is the Young Mills gradient flow sort of nonlinearity plus sigma times noise. Okay. Now of course the only bit that actually depends on sigma is this, right? It's just the strength of the noise. Um, then in uh, the C epsilon is actually of the form. Right, so now the C epsilon actually depends on sigma as well, right? So the claim is for every nonlinearity, you can find these C epsilon, so this, uh, uh, this property is true. Um, so it depends on sigma. Uh, and, you know, there is an explicit formula for them. And so in 3D, it turns out that it depends on sigma in the way that there's a term which is quadratic and so I'm called, going to call it C epsilon two, and there's a term that's quartic, C epsilon four. Okay, and so th those of you who've ever seen how you read Omelas phi four in three dimensions, you recognize it's exactly the same thing, right? Um, and they diverge in the same way, right? So it's sort of like phi four. So that guy will actually diverge like one of epsilon, and that guy will really diverge like log epsilon. Yeah. Um, now this comes from sort of like the explicit expression that you have for these constants, okay? But that's easy to see from these explicit expressions. Uh, that doesn't really require any calculations. So, okay, so we know this. Um, and 
so let me write, say, write C epsilon, uh, so either two or four, um, and then, I don't know, bad. For the projection, so for the projection of um, this C epsilon two or four onto the orthogonal complement of PG. Okay, you can choose it. It doesn't really matter which inner product you choose, right? So you just choose some complement uh, of PG, okay? And now what we want to show, right? So what we want to show at the end of the day is that this is finite, right? So we want to show that these guys, um, that these guys are actually uniformly bounded in, uh, in epsilon, right? So at the end of the day, we want to just set sigma equal to one. Okay, we're really interested in sigma equal to one, uh, but it's going to, convenient, to be convenient for us to allow sigma to vary. Uh, and so what we're interested in showing, so we want to show that the bad bits, C epsilon two and four bad, um, well, converges to some constant as epsilon goes to zero. Okay, I'm not actually going to show that it converges to a constant, I'm just going to show that it stays bounded. Uh, but then one can do a similar argument to actually show that it converges to a constant. Okay, so the argument, the main bit of the argument is about showing that it stays bounded. Okay, a priori, a priori what you expect is that the two guy blows up like one over epsilon in three dimensions and the four guy blows up like log epsilon. Uh, in two dimension, it's somehow a similar story, but it's easier. In two dimension, this guy disappears and you only have this guy and it blows up like log epsilon. Again, like four, five, four. Okay. Um, okay. So we want to show that this, uh, this projection somehow remains bounded. Um, and so now assume that it's not. Right, so we, we're going to go by contradiction. Okay, so by contradiction, assume that say the sum of the C2 epsilon bad and the C4 epsilon bad goes to infinity. Okay, so assume that they don't remain bounded, so at least one of them uh, has to blow up. Okay. Um, and now what we do is we choose sigma to depend on epsilon in such a way that um, if I take sigma square, sigma epsilon square, the C epsilon two bad plus sigma epsilon four, uh, C epsilon four bad, right? So that this say is equal to one, okay? Um, a particular, this tells you that Therefore, sigma epsilon goes to zero by, you know, the, the assumption. Right? I mean, by, by this, by how contradictory assumption, okay? So since we assume that these guys diverge, the only way that you can stay, make it remain bounded is by multiplying by something that goes to zero, okay? So these guys have to go to zero. Um, 
so so now first I can use now I use compactness right so if I look at the so I look at that space of pairs of matrices um, and I look at the subset which is those pairs of matrices so that the sum of norms is equal to one that's a compact set right it's basically some kind of a sphere in a relatively high dimensional but finite space okay so it's a compact set um, so by compactness I can assume that these two guys converge to a limit. Okay, so that sigma epsilon square, C epsilon two bad converges to some limit, C tilde two, and the same for the four guy. All right, so there's a four here and then a four here uh, and a four here. Right, so that's just by compactness because I chose it in such a way that their norm stays one and so they're in a compact set. Um, so, so I'm going to just pass to that subsequence, right? So that's along some subsequence in epsilon and I'm just going to go along that subsequence now. Uh, so I assume that you have that limit. And actually one can also guarantee, so I can guarantee that the sum of these two guys, so that C tilde two plus C tilde four is actually non-zero. Um, how do I guarantee that? Well, so if it's non-zero, that means obviously one is minus the other one, uh, but then what I could do, so is instead of making, you know, instead of making this precise choice of the sigma epsilon, I could, for example, choose the sigma epsilon twice as big. Okay, so it doesn't really change much. Instead of having these guys equal to one, now they're, I don't know, smaller than four or something, or smaller than maybe 16, or I don't know what. Um, but the effect is if I just multiply the sigma by two, um, then this guy gets multiplied by four, but this guy gets multiplied by 16, right? And so if they are if one is equal to minus the other one before doing that, then it's certainly not going to be the case anymore after doing that. Okay, so by just slightly changing my sigma, uh, I can guarantee that this is non-zero. Okay, if, so, so I can, so I do that. And okay, so now what happens? So on the one hand, we know, so by, by the sort of black box theorem, um, we know that if I take u epsilon of f sigma and then plus uh, the whole c epsilon a, right, uh, that this converges to, it converges to a limit but you see here, sigma also depends on epsilon. Right? So sigma also depends on epsilon. But remember, the point here is that everything is actually very stable. So here in that theorem, uh, this everything is continuous in F. Okay, so in particular, I'm allowed to change F as epsilon goes to zero. So everything is also sort of like locally uniformly continuous. Uh, you have really nice stability properties. So I'm allowed to actually change F as epsilon goes to zero and then you converge to the limiting F. Right? Um, but now the limiting guy here is a, you know, U of F zero. But U of F zero is actually just the deterministic Young-Mills flow. Right, so this guy, I know I have a guarantee that this converges to the deterministic Young-Mills flow. So the one without any noise, which is just a parabolic PDE. Okay. Um, and now what, oh, maybe I should, maybe we should do a break. I already, uh, we were supposed to do a break five minutes ago. Um, yeah, so because I don't think I'm going to be able to finish the argument within two minutes, so that's not okay. So let's do the break now, maybe. Okay, uh, questions perhaps? Uh, okay.
So I have actually two questions. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned earlier this theorem that if the equation has a symmetry, then you know that the uh, uh, that the that the um, that the renormalization has to preserve that symmetry. I imagine that's not term by term, right? Well, so that kind of depends. So here it was actually term by term, right? Okay. So so like these guys here. Well, it's quite easy to actually see that all of these sort of have to drop. I see. So it's not right. some magic cancellation that... In a way here, there isn't really a magic cancellation, right? So in order to drop these guys, uh, there isn't really a magic cancellation. Okay. Um, and my, my yeah. other question... Because is... so, so these guys actually, what you, what you end up seeing... Um, so I think, so if I remember correctly, like this guy and that guy, um, you can explicitly, if you just look at the corresponding randomization constants, mm -hmm. um, they end up being like expectations of odd powers of Gaussians. And so then they drop. Oh, okay. um, so these guys drop instantly in a way you can also, you can see it like that. Uh, and that guy, uh, that one you can kind of, so I think you see that uh, the formula for the randomization constant is itself sort of like anti-symmetric on the x goes mm -hmm. to minus x and therefore it has to be zero or you know, something I like see. that. Yeah. And, and my second question is about these renormalization constants that you find here. Is stuff about them known in equilibrium? Because I imagine people have looked at the invariant measure. Well, except that they don't... No, because... Um, they don't get the invariant measure in that way somehow, right? I mean, yeah, like in, two in two dimension, you get the invariant measure by just guessing what it is, right? Right. So, so then oh, you see. have it somehow, right? So you have it, it's <laughs> like, it's where you don't get it as a limit as epsilon goes to zero of something, right? So you just write down what all the Wilson loop observables are. You just write down the joint distribution right. of all of them and then that's it, right? So that's your measure. Uh, and in three dimensions, well, there the, the, are these works by Balaban uh, that get something. Um, but yeah, so I guess, okay, so I guess his stuff is probably what's closest to this. Um, yeah, but it's different because you see, so in his case, he starts from a lattice gauge theory. And so you have already, you have gauge invariants at the microscopic level. Right, so the photo lattice gauge theory. And then, and then basically the whole rigidity of the whole thing means that there's no randomization constant showing up ever. I see. Whereas here, the problem is that the mollifying the noise actually breaks gauge invariance formally. But so can you just repeat, I didn't understand why he doesn't have to do that because he takes another regularization. So he doesn't get things, right? So he doesn't do, he doesn't take as a starting point something like a, a smoothened out free field with a density that would be, you know, e to the minus Young Mills action or something mm -hmm. like that, right? Because that doesn't work because you can't, um, right? because the Young Mills action is constant in sort of infinitely many directions, mm -hmm. right? So you, so you don't have a good, Right. Uh, yeah. So you don't have a good reference measure. So th there's no obvious way of approximating the measure at the level of connections. I see. And so what he does is he sort of writes, he starts off with a lattice gauge theory. Um, and, then, and then what you want to do is you want to somehow kind of pass to the limit and still have something left for some kind of observables. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's what he does. But but you could look at the equation on a lattice as well, couldn't you? Yes, so you could, right. So you could, for example, uh, that's right. So you could in principle look at the equation on a lattice and then take a discretization, which would basically just be a lattice gauge theory uh, and try to pass to the limit for that. Um, that becomes super messy at the level of the SPD. So, so in two dimension, that's what Howe did um, in the case where the uh, G is abelian. Mm -hmm. 
Right, so in the case where G is abelian, the limiting equation is trivial. The limiting equation is just stochastic heat equation, right? Because all the Lie brackets are zero, mm -hmm. and all the nonlinearities have Lie brackets. So, and even in that case, where the limit is trivial, uh, showing that the lattice gauge theory converges to the limit, you know, is sort of non-trivial. It's a it's a non-trivial piece of work, and that's in two dimensions. Mm -hmm. So if you do this in three dimensions. You know, you end up with something which to lowest order kind of looks like the thing you want formally, but then you have tons of, right? So you have all sorts of uh, terms which you would have to do an expansion, right? So you have some sort of a guess of how large this connection is across each bond. Um, and it's going to be kind of small, but not that small. Uh, yeah, how also, okay, yeah, how also have the Higgs field, that's right. Um, then, so the connection is sort of small, but not that small. And so in all these terms where you had like an exponential of the, uh, right, so we wrote these gamma xy's as sort of e to the epsilon a, and we just said, well, formally, you just keep the first term and then that's it. Mm -hmm. oh, but actually what you see then is that like the first, you know, the next term is actually not that small. Uh, and so you can't just throw it away. And mm -hmm. so you in, end up with like tons of terms. Um, and then what should happen is that all of these terms precisely kind of diverge in such a way that all the divergences cancel out, right? Mm -hmm. So that there shouldn't be that all the randomization constants should somehow cancel out, right? Uh, but then you have to somehow prove that and show that you have to see that, right? I see. Um, as like here, you see, even here at the level of the SPD, if you just in three dimension, if you actually explicitly write out the log correction for this constant, right? So there's a log correction, mm -hmm. which is going to be like a log epsilon times something. Uh, and that's something, so in phi four, it's just one big integral, right? So there's the sort of triple integral of a heat kernel or something, and then you, you can actually extract which prefactor comes out in front of the log, right, with a bit of work. Well, here it's a similar thing, but instead of having one of these integrals, you have like a hundred of them or so. so you have like a ridiculous number. Uh, and then in principle, the, you know, there should be some sort of magic cancellation that if you do a similar sort of thing for the lattice one, where you would expect probably even more of them, then there should be a magic cancellation that they all actually cancel out. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Okay, maybe we should really have like a, maybe seven minutes break and come back at five past. Okay, so, right, so what have we seen? So if you, so I made that claim, which uh, I just ask you to trust me that this con randomization constant in the case where the noise, uh, I take the strength of the noise into account is of this form. Um, and now what I've done is I've sent the strength of the noise to zero in precisely such a way that the bad part of the randomization constant, so the one that doesn't commute with add g for some fixed g, uh, that that guy converges to some non-zero limit. Okay, so I've just made a choice of sigma epsilon so that assuming that the bad part of the randomization constant diverges, um, um, I've made sure that you get a non-zero limit here. Okay, um, and so for this whole thing, the main assumption that we made for our argument by contradiction was that we assumed that the bad part diverges. Um, and so if we end up with a contradiction, that means that this was false, right? So that the bad part actually 
um, stays bounded. So the first step now was to show that um, if I simply look at the renormalized equation, well, from the black box theorem, I know that this converges to a limit and the limit is the same limit, right? So the point here is that the limits, you can get the limit and you can commute these limits. So everything is continuous um, as a function of the nonlinearity. And so if by making the nonlinearity here, depending on sigma, if I send sigma to zero, the limit that I, should, that I get, I know a priori that this will be the same as the one that I would get if I simply set sigma equal to zero in the first place from the start. Right? But if I set sigma to zero in the first place, then there's no randomization because the randomization constants will have to be zero and the equation is deterministic anyway, so it doesn't require randomization. Um, and then there's, you know, it doesn't even depend on epsilon. So what you get is simply the solution to the deterministic equation. Okay. Um, and so now what we do is we apply add G to the equation. Okay, so if I write, um, so writing say A bar is equal to add G A. And so here G is fixed, right? So G is, so this G is not an element of the big gauge group, it's just an element of the structure group, right? So it's just an element of our Lie group G. So it's, it doesn't vary in space and it doesn't vary in time, okay? So it's just a fixed element of the Lie group. Uh, so in particular, if you want, this is also equal to G applied to A if I identify it with the element of the gauge group, which is just constant in space and time, okay? Um, so now if I look at the equation for A bar, well, then G doesn't depend on time, right? So this is really just the adjoint action applied to DTA. And then the adjoint action is sort of a morphism of Lie algebra. So whenever I apply the adjoint action to a Lie bracket, that's the same as applying the Lie bracket to the two argument to which I've applied the adjoint action to each of them separately, okay? Uh, and so it means I can put the adjoint action inside all of the Lie brackets and, and also it commutes with derivatives. So it means that for all of these terms, um, Okay, so the equation, yeah, okay, the equation is too far back. Uh, but for every single term, I can simply move the adjoint action inside. It commutes with everything, okay? And so what I see then is I simply get uh, the original equation back. Okay, so it's the same equation as what we had, but just with A bar uh, instead of A. Um, but then we have the adjoint action applied to our noise. So now let me look at the equation, the epsilon dependent equation, and I'm going to look at the renormalized epsilon dependent equation. So I also have the adjoint action that applies to my C epsilon um, A. Right. But now you see here, a priori, I don't know anything about the uh, uh, C epsilon, right? So I know that as far as the good bits are concerned, it commutes with the adjoint action. So I can, so for the good part of C epsilon, I can kind of move the adjoint action inside here. But for the bad part, I can't, right? Um, for the noise, um, this, on the Lie algebra, the adjoint action is an orthogonal transformation. Okay, so on the noise space, even if I mollify the noise, the mollification just happens in space, right? Um, at a fixed point, this is still a Gaussian which has a covariance, uh, which is ad invariant. Okay, and then that tells you that this guy is really just like a rotation you know, and Gaussians are invariant on the rotations. 
Okay, so this guy in law is equal in law to just psi epsilon itself. Okay, and so what we see is we, we get the full, the exact same equation with a bar, so including the renormalization and everything, but uh, we get an extra term, which is we get a commutator. Bet uh, no, we don't get a commutator. Sorry, we get a um, we get a term of the form right. So this here, I can of course rewrite it as. Oops, that's not what I wanted to use. So this here, I can of course write it as add G inverse A bar. Right? Um, and then for the good part of C, since it commutes with add, this is just a good part of C, but the bad part, I don't know anything about it. It might change, right? Um, so what I end up with here is I end up with a term which is uh, something like the add G, the bad part, uh, C epsilon bad, two plus C epsilon bad, four, add G inverse A bar, um, and minus the same thing without the adds. Right? Okay, so you see I have exactly the same equation as before, except that I get this extra term. All right, so I have this extra term here. And this extra term here as epsilon goes to zero converges to a limit, right? So that was, um, I've chosen, right? So that's precisely these guys. Oh, I see with my notation, I should have still taken into account, yeah, sorry. So there's, of course, there's the sigma still here. And of course here, there's a sigma square, sigma four, sigma square, sigma four. Um, and of course here, sigma, okay. So I've chosen my sequence of epsilon in such a way that this guy converges to a limit. Okay. Um, and this part of the equation, I know, so that's what we've seen um, already. So this part of the equation, that's the part that just converges to uh, the deterministic Young Mills flow, right? Um, So what we conclude from this is that on the one hand, if I take, you see, now we have two, we get two different convergence results from this. Okay? So if we apply U epsilon, Um, to F sigma plus add G C epsilon, add G inverse A, okay. Then on the one hand, that's the calculation we just did, right? So the U epsilon, so this is, the equation we've seen that if we just take the equation, we apply add to both sides, we get exactly the same equation back, except that uh, the counter term gets conjugated with uh, add G, okay? So therefore, um, on the one hand, since all we've done is that we've applied G, add G to the whole equation, 
and the young Mills flow, the deterministic young Mills flow is invariant under applying add G to the whole equation. So we know a priori that this actually has to also converge to just the deterministic young Mills flow. Right. On the other hand, the calculation we just did tells us that this converges to the deterministic young Mills flow with a counter term, which is this add G C tilde at G inverse minus C tilde, where if I call this whole thing, this converges to some limit, which I'm going to denote by C tilde. Okay, so you see that we just interpret this in, in two slightly different ways. So on the one hand, we say conjugation by G, well, if I simply conjugate an equation by G and pass to the limit, since this is a continuous operation, uh, the limit that I'm going to get is simply the limit that I got before conjugated by G, okay? Um, and the limit I got before was the deterministic Young-Mills flow, and that one is invariant on the conjugation by G. And so I have to get the same limit as before. On the other hand, I can just look at explicitly what do I get when I conjugate by G. And what I see is that I get the same equation as before, but with an extra term, which is this term here. Okay, and therefore it also has to converge to, you know, the same limit as before, but with that extra term present. Um, and now, well, you know, we get a contradiction because we assumed that this is non-zero, right? So this guy, um, this C tilde was the projection onto uh, the space, the orthogonal complement to those guys who commute with add G, right? So I know that the C tilde itself, I know for a fact that it does not commute with add G, right? But this equation here is just a commutator between add G and C tilde, you know, multiplied by whatever add G, uh, yeah, just multiplied by add G inverse. Right? Um, so this is an invertible matrix, right? This is a non-zero matrix. And therefore, this whole thing is non-zero, right? So this whole thing is non-zero. And so now we claim that the solution to this equation, right? So it's really equal in terms of solution maps. So we claim that the solution map to the Young-Mills equation is equal to the solution map to the Young-Mills equation with an additional linear term on the right-hand side. That's obviously nonsense. Right? Because I can just look at a solution. Solutions are smooth, so I can just stick it into the equation and either it satisfies one or the other, but it cannot satisfy both at the same time. Right? Um, and so that gives us a contradiction. Martin? Yes. This is sort of uh, exactly where it's important that this solution map that you are talking about is sort of in law, right? Because pathwise this. Uh... That's right. Yes. So here it was important that we, yeah, that's exactly right. So here is where we use the fact that the, the U guy, we only considered the law of the U because otherwise you will, right? So this identity, of course, only holds in law. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So, so we conclude that our premise was false. Um, and that tells you that these guys here actually have to be bounded. Um, and then even if they are bounded, you can do a sort of similar kind of argument. You know, basically if they are bounded, the claim is that they actually have to converge to a limit. And essentially the reason is that, you know, you go by contradiction again, you say, assume that you can get two different limits and then you do a similar sort of argument. Uh, to say that the two limits actually have to be the same. Okay, so, so you can actually show in pretty much the same way uh, that these bad terms actually have finite limits. Okay. 
Um, and that's really now the bad terms like this guys, right? So that's the thing that multiplied the powers of sigma. So now we can set sigma equal to one, which is the thing we wanted to do all along, right? Uh, so we really wanted to just consider sigma equal to one, then the randomization constant is just the sum of these two guys. And now what we know is that the sum of these two guys is of the form something that something good, which is basically something which is a multiple of the identity plus something bad, but that converges to a finite limit. Okay. And therefore, well, you know, if the equation which is renormalized by that constant converges to some limit, then if I subtract the bad bit, then it's still going to converge to a finite limit, right? Because the bad bit is just some finite constant. Now it's just some finite constant operator. So I can subtract it and I still get a limit. I get a different limit, but I still get a limit, okay? Um, so what we conclude from this whole business is that we can take C epsilon scalar, right? To just be multiple of the identity. And we get, we can still choose it in such a way that we get a finite limit. But still, we don't know that the C epsilon itself is bounded or zero or something like that, right? So I make no claim about this. But what we know is that now we can renormalize the equation by just adding a constant, a term which is like constant times a. Uh, and if you choose this constant in the right way, you get a finite limit. Okay. So uh, now the final, uh, the final thing we want to show in the last, what do I have, 20 minutes, um, is we want to show that So we want to show that the C epsilon can be chosen in such a way um, that the limit is gauge invariant. So, so what we want to do now is what I already I think mentioned at the end of last lecture or the lecture before, um, is we take some initial condition A naught, and then we take some initial condition G naught applied to A naught, where now the G naught really belongs to the you know, to the actual gauge group, uh, not just the group G, right? So the G naught is an element of the gauge group that's allowed to depend on space. Um, and then, you know, we get a solution map here, but that solution map depends on the choice of C epsilon, right? So there's still one degree of freedom in this business, which is that we can choose Right? We can always choose to just add some finite number to the constant C epsilon and you're going to get a limit, which would be a different limit. Right? So we have a one parameter family of possible solution maps here. Um, and then there's a, the claim is that there's exactly one choice of that parameter. So that if, if I look at the law of that solution map, uh, you can find Um, so let me see. Uh, so I'm going to write, say, a t here. And then the claim is that you can find some time dependent gauge transformation, g t applied to a t, so that if I look at the law of the solution here, starting from a naught, um, and I apply that time dependent gauge transformation, then I get the same as if I look at the law of the solution starting from G naught applied to A naught. Okay, so that's what we want to show. So there's two ways of getting a process here. 
The first one is to apply to this process some suitably chosen time-dependent gauge transformation. And the second one is to just start with this initial condition and solve my SPD. Right? Um, and in both cases, what I get depends on the precise choice of that randomization constant. Okay? And so the claim now is that there is exactly one choice so that these two ways of obtaining a process here are guaranteed to be the same, to give you the same process in law. Okay. So, so let's, um, well, let's see what actually happens if you apply, you know, so the first thing we want to do is to have a guess of what is a good gauge transformation to apply here. Okay, so I have to kind of figure out what the GT should be. Um, and for this, what we're going to do is, well, um, we simply take an arbitrary gauge transformation. Right? So we take an arbitrary GT. Uh, we assume that a, AT solves our original equation, and then we see, well, what equation does GT apply to AT solve? Um, and then what we want to do is we want to find an evolution for GT so that the new equation looks as much as possible like the old one, okay? So, so for say arbitrary, T maps to GT. Um, well, so I, I do it, I do the calculation in two bits. So there are, there are, because there are some bits that we've already done, right? So with last time, maybe the time before, yeah, so in the, in the second lecture, remember we added this, the Turk term. We said, if you just look at the gradient flow for the Young-Mills energy, it doesn't give you a parabolic equation. So you want to add something different. And so you wanted to add a term here, which was, which was sort of, you know, moving in the direction of the gauge orbits. And for this, what we did is we did this calculation where we wanted to figure out what the tangent space of the gauge orbits looked like. And for this, we precisely did that. So we precisely did the calculation of what does the time derivative of some arbitrary time dependent uh, element of the gauge group apply to a fixed connection A look like, right? And so what we saw was that this is minus the covariant derivative in the GTA direction of DTG times G inverse. Right, and then we deduced from that that somehow the tangent space looked like, you know, old covariant derivatives of arbitrary things. Okay, so that's a calculation we already did. On the other hand, if you have a fixed G and A evolves according to your equation, um, then what do you get? So the first term is the one that really comes from the gradient of the Young-Mills flow, and this one is gauge equivariance. And so that means that you just get the same term back, right? So that was the G A T star curvature of G A T. Um, there's one term that comes from the noise, right? So you get basically just the adjoint action on the noise. Um, and then we had this additional term, right, which was covariant derivative of A applied to D star A. Okay. Um, so now first, well, the covariant derivative behaves in a way correctly under the adjoint action. And that means I can basically pull it through. 
uh, so this is equal. So this is equal to the covariant derivative of in the direction of G applied to A um, of add of D star A. But now this term um, is in general not gauge equivalent. So you need to do a calculation. So um, maybe, yeah, so maybe I just tell you what the answer is. So this here is equal to um, D star of G times A, which is kind of the thing that we want. Uh, but then there are extra terms. So you get a di of dig times g inverse. And you also get an extra term, which is a minus, um, well, I'll say actually plus g times a, Lie bracket with dig ai times g inverse. Okay, so. This is just an explicit calculation. It's very, it's a very simple sort of explicit calculation. You just look at the definition of these terms. Okay. Um, so, so now if we apply, so if we just apply DT, so let me just delete this term. So if we apply now the time derivative to GT apply to AT, essentially by the Leibniz rule, it's like the sum of these two terms. So it's just equal to the sum of all of these things. Okay. And now what we see is that there's, um, well, and of course there's the, the, so that's without the renormalization, right? Then there's the term that comes from the renormalization. Um, which was a term of the form, right? So that was just C epsilon, um, which is now a constant. So that's just a scalar. Um, it was C epsilon. What you get is the adjoint action applied to A, but that's not exactly G applied to A, right? So G applied to A Remember that's the adjoint action minus dg times g inverse. And so if you just have the adjoint action that gives you g applied to a plus dg times g inverse, right? So this comes from the randomization. So now what you see is there's a, um, if I combine, if I look at this term, this term, this term and this term, that looks basically like the original equation, just with A replaced by G acting on A, right? The only difference, so that was my first term in the Young-Mills, so that's the Young-Mills gradient flow. That was this the Turk term. Um, this is the noise. The noise has now changed. Um, now we have to be a little bit careful. You see, previously we said, well, this in law is just equal to Xi epsilon. This is not true anymore, okay? Because before we really used the fact that the noise, uh, that the G was constant in space, okay? Uh, so here now G is not constant in space. So if the noise were white, then yes, this would still be an orthogonal transformation of your uh, abstract Wiener space. Okay, and therefore in law it would be the same. But if the noise is mollified, right? So if it's not white, then this is not an orthogonal transformation in the abstract Wiener space that corresponds to this noise. Okay, so this noise is not equal in law to Xi epsilon. Okay. Of course, it's 
it looks still like some kind of approximation of white noise, but it's a different approximation of white noise. Okay. Um, and so, and now we have a bunch of additional terms, right? So, so we have, um, we have this term here and we have these two terms here and we have um, this term here. So now what we would like to do is we'd like to take, well, so ideally we would want to cancel all of them out, but actually not really, right? So it's like, if this guy were equal to that one in law and all of these red terms canceled out, then we'd be happy because we really just would have the original equation back, right? So then we'd have exactly what we want. We would see that we have this time dependent gauge transformation which guarantees that if we apply the time dependent gauge transformation to a solution of the original equation, we get back something which is again, just a solution to our equation. Okay. But now here you see there are two problems. So the first one is that these are not actually the same in law. The second problem is that this term here is not of the form covariant derivative in the direction of g times a of something, right? So here I can, you see this guy gets hit with this term. And so in order to cancel out this with that, all I have to do is cancel out this with that, right? Because they both get, to get hit by this covariant derivative. This guy doesn't. Okay. And so now the, if you want the miraculous cancellation that happens here, and that's the claim. So the claim is that if you choose this constant here in precisely the, the right way, so we don't have that much, right? So we, we don't have a choice on how this constant diverges, right? Because it will diverge uh, and we don't have any, you know, it diverges in the way that it diverges and that's it. But the only thing that we can do is we can add some finite amount to it, right? And you still converge to a limit. Okay? And the claim is that it's possible to add the correct finite amount to that constant so that in the limit, this term here precisely compensates for the fact that these two guys are not the same in law. Okay, so that's the claim that you can precisely compensate the fact that these two guys are not the same in law by choosing the right constant here. Right? Uh, and so then the G, the way we want to define our time dependent G is just, you know, by guaranteeing that this term here is equal to minus this so that these bits all cancel out. So, so we define uh, GT by DTG, G inverse is equal to DI, DI, G, G inverse plus, uh, let me call it say A bar I dig g inverse and the a bar is actually just g applied to a okay um, and what we see is that the equation for a bar for a bar is given by uh, dt a bar is equal to Laplacian a bar plus 
you know, all this nonlinear stuff, then plus our renormalization constant applied to A bar, plus add G applied to Xi epsilon, and then plus this additional term C epsilon, DG, DG inverse. Okay. Um, and now the claim is that if you choose the constant C um, in the correct way, then the law of the solution for A bar is the same as the law of the solution for A. Okay. So the theorem is that there exists a unique choice of the C epsilon such that, well, so first the choice is such that, you know, it differs by order one from the C epsilon that's given by the black box theorem. So it's still such that you actually converge to a limit. Right? So that solutions converge as epsilon goes to zero and such that simultaneously the law of A bar is equal to the law of A if you start them from the same initial condition, of course. Right. So like the solution map for A bar is the same as the solution map for A in law. Okay. Um, of course, it cannot be pathwise again because this guy is conjugated by G. Um, okay, so since I have only one minute, uh, I think <laughs> I think I'm not going to uh, explain much how you prove this, but you know, actually in a way the proof is very similar to the proof that I actually just showed you, uh, you know, for the fact that the randomization constants can be chosen scalar. Okay, it's really the same type of proof. So you can, so a big chunk of the proof, you can do it in almost exactly the same way. So you again do these tricks of somehow, you know, putting a sigma in front of the noise, uh, using the fact that then as sigma goes to zero, you just converge to the deterministic um, Young-Mills flow. And then again, the deterministic one is also invariant under arbitrary gauge transformations or equivariant in the right way um, and so on. And so you do exactly the same type of argument. Um, it's a little bit more subtle because the, uh, well, Okay, so a priori it looks like the black box doesn't apply because G doesn't even take values in the linear space, for example, right? Because now our equation, the equation that we have to look at is not just this equation. We have to look at the pair of equations, which is this equation together with that equation for G, right? So this is now a pair of sort of coupled SPDs and doesn't quite, it looks like it doesn't quite fit into the framework of the black box because this guy is not even, doesn't even take values in a linear space, right? Now, of course you could say, well, you know, I just assume that my Lie group is a matrix group or so, and then it takes values in some space of matrices, but then you would need to show that you actually stay, you know, in the SAT manifold that's actually given by your Lie group. And then again, that's non-trivial because these things become very irregular. Um, so it turns out here that there's a trick, which is that this guy takes values in a linear space, right? So this guy takes values in just the Lie algebra. And then this guy as an operator also takes values in a linear space, which is just the linear maps from the Lie algebra to itself. And it turns out that you can actually rewrite this pair of equations into a triple of autonomous equations for the A bar and for these two quantities, right? So you don't actually need to keep track of G itself. Uh, it's enough to keep track of this quantity here and this quantity here, and they both naturally live in a linear space, okay? Um, and if you write down the equation that they satisfy, you can actually see that this equation can be written again in terms of these two quantities. So you get an autonomous system of equations when you do that, and then you can kind of apply the black box theorems to that system of three uh, coupled SPDs, okay? 
Um, and then the rest of the argument is actually quite really very similar uh, to the argument that I just, just gave for showing that this constant C epsilon can be taken to be a scalar. It's really the same type of argument. Okay, so I think I'll stop here and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Martin. And let's perhaps uh, all unmute ourselves and uh, round of applause for Martin from Fantastic. So well, this would be a good time for have a, having questions to Martin. So you can freely just unmute yourself and ask a question if you want. Can I ask the obvious question? Can you get at least in 2D how hard is glo global existence for this thing on the torus? Um, yeah, it's it's really not clear. Uh, right, so all these solution theories are local. Um, in 2D, so for example, okay, there's, so there's even, you know, so there's one technical difficulty which already makes formulating these things a bit horrible, mm -hmm. right? Which is that it's not even clear, like so, since solutions may blow up, right? So you start with an A naught, so that guy might actually blow up in finite time. Mm -hmm. Now you start with the gauge, you take the gauge transformed one. If that guy blows up, it's not clear whether this guy blows up at the same time, right? So it might be, and you see, the thing is that you can have, you could have in principle, a perfectly well-defined process at the level of the gauge orbits in 2D, but so that the SPD, which represents just sort of one particular instance of the guy, uh, that that one blows up in finite time. Because you see, you can, since the orbits are non-compact, you can stay on one orbit and actually still blow up. Right? So as a process on the space of gauge orbits, you would be constant, but as an SPD, you would actually blow up, right? But morally, you would have expected so, to have solved that with this deterred trick or not? Morally? Well, not. morally, but it's not clear, right? Okay, okay, okay. So, so it, doesn't, it doesn't prove that. Sure. Um, and so, so in 2D, for example, in order to actually build, so in 2D, we can really build a Markov process on that space of gauge orbits, that mm -hmm. quotient space that I described on Wednesday. Uh, but for this, we actually already have to restart the SPD at random times. Mm -hmm. Right. So what you do is you, you sort of follow the SPD. The thing is that the gauge orbits, you should really kind of think of them as the way I drew it in the sense that, you know, they are non-compact. So you can kind of, you can sort of go to infinity here by staying on the same orbit. You can kind of go out. Um, but the chunk of the orbit that's somehow in a, like a bounded region of space looks kind of nice. So it doesn't fold back on itself in a crazy way. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and so what you do then is you say, well, I kind of follow my SPD, um, but then at some point it may be that your SP the solution to the SPD sort of looks like this, and it ends up being on a gauge orbit where the gauge orbit is kind of nice, but it's just far out. And then what you do is at that point you stop it. So you do some sort of stopping time, a random stopping time that detects this. So you stop it and you apply a gauge transformation to it which sort of moves it back into the nice regions of that gauge orbit. And then you restart the SPD there, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so in that way, we built really that Markov process on the space of gauge orbits, which is well-defined until, so it could still blow up, but we know that if it blows up, it's really, it really blows up in the space of gauge orbit. So in the sense that it, it ends up being in orbits that really, don't intersect finite balls of your state space anymore. So it really moves out in the space of orbits rather than just moving out along an orbit. But, but would you expect that to happen? These topics? No, of course you wouldn't expect that to happen. No, of course you expect to have global, uh, global solutions because you're, well, you have a candidate invariant measure for the guy, right? On the space of gauge orbits, all the Wilson loops are observable, are well defined. And so the 2D Young Mills measure which you have in a way that is actually a well-defined measure 
on that space. Well, I don't know, did we prove that? Uh, I suppose that's more or less proof. I mean, well, Ilya proved that for a slight variant of that space. So Ilya has a paper where he proved that mm -hmm. for a variant. Uh, so I guess probably the same proof would also work for this space, right? So you, already, you have a candidate invariant measure. So therefore you obviously expect global solutions because you expect that you have, you expect that that invariant measure is really the invariant measure for that process. And you so my question is, do you expect the blow up along these orbits to ever happen? I mean, that you now by hand remove again, but do you expect that? This I really don't know. Okay. Yeah, probably not, but okay. yeah, probably not. But the thing is that you see, so the, the nonlinear, so in, in some sense, in terms of PDE kind of behavior, um, you know, it looks like, let me see, so where's the PDE again? But um, I mean, this bit sort of looks like a phi four sort of thing, mm -hmm. but it really behaves more like a Navier-Stokes sort of thing. Right? Mm -hmm. Uh, in the sense that formally this preserves the L2 norm this time, this guy. All right, so both of the, all of these are sort of norm preserving terms. Mm -hmm. So, right, so they, they don't give you much coercivity. So it's a cubic term, but that actually kind of rotates rather than pointing inwards. But in the deterministic case, I suppose this blow up long orbits doesn't happen, does it? Well, so in the, Terministic case, you know that you have global solutions um, by, well, I'm not sure, I'd have to check on the paper. Okay, so there are definitely papers about global solutions in the deterministic case, but you use the Young-Mills energy. So, because it's a gradient flow. Mm -hmm. And so you know that the Young-Mills energy decreases along the flow. Mm -hmm. um, but there, of course, that's again, not super nice because it's not, really coercive, right? because right. it has this sort of infinite dimensional symmetry group. Um, and so you still need to work to actually get global solutions. But, uh, but there are, so as far as I remember, so there is this, there is a paper by a guy, I don't remember the name of the guy, Road or something like this, um, from maybe 90s, um, where he gets global solutions of the young mills flow in 3D. And then in 4D, it's much, much harder, right? So there's a famous paper by uh, Uhlenbeck where she, she analyzes the deterministic flow in 4D and you have this bubbling phenomena and stuff like that. So it really has complicated phenomena. Mm -hmm. um, but in 3D, you actually have sort of global nice solutions. And I think it's without having to restart, but I'm not absolutely sure. Mm -hmm. now, I think there was a question that I think perhaps we scared away with our long discussion. Somebody had raised uh, his or her hands. Oh, yeah. Hi, uh, I have a relatively naive question about the uniqueness of C epsilon. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it a bit, uh, you see, it doesn't seem very obvious why, why it's unique. Does it have a deeper meaning, for example, between the relation of the gauge group and the black box that you have? The fact that it's unique is somehow miraculous. For yeah, so in a way, simple. It, yeah, so it's really because of the fact that the um, essentially it tells you that within the class of equations that you're considering, there's really only one that's gauge invariant, right? And that's the thing that that's really the thing that gives you the uniqueness. Yeah. Um, and of course, the bit that is sort of maybe slightly miraculous is that you know that's a statement at the deterministic level in a way. If there's no noise. And you just look at equations of this type and you allow yourself to add, you know, pretty much any term, uh, you know, which scales in this way. So you take pretty much any equation of the, so forget about the noise. So you take any equation of this form and you're allowed to add terms like that. So you have heat equation and then plus, you know, any bilinear operator in A and DA, any trilinear operator in A, bilinear stuff in A and so on, right? So you take anything like this, but you want like all the symmetries that you have, right? So you want the gauge invariance um, and yeah, maybe you also want to impose a couple of symmetries like that. I'm not sure you have to even impose that. Um, so then the claim is that there's really only one 
that's gauge invariant, which is the one that we wrote down. Right? Um, and this uniqueness of the C epsilon is sort of a reflection of the fact that this carries over to the stochastic case. And that's a, relative, that's a sort of generic feature, but it's not obvious. Right? Because you really, of course, the whole smooth analysis it becomes, you know, you can do things formally pretending everything is smooth, but of course, none of the terms makes any sense. So it's really not obvious that this type of argument actually carries over to the stochastic case, but it does. And maybe um, one question. Um, so the trick you have to get from the SPD on the Lie group to the Lie algebra, is that trick like a more generally applicable type thing or is it really specific to this setting? Uh, yeah, good question. I don't know actually. I think it's pretty, it's probably quite specific to this setting, but um, yeah, no, I don't know. It's a good question. Okay. Well, I mean, we we didn't figure that out by, you know, for like deep reasons or something. We figured it out by just doing the calculation. Okay. Thanks. I have a very short. Uh, is it a possible extra rate of convergence rate in what in epsilon? Uh, yeah, yeah, you can extract rates in epsilon. Um, you know, if you basically don't do any work, you get a rate, but it's going to be a lousy rate. You know, you get a rate like epsilon to the power of one hundredth or something like that. Uh, and presumably in reality, it would be, well, okay, so the best, yeah, I guess you can get epsilon to the one half, right? Because you can work because the solute in three dimensions or something, you should probably be able to get epsilon to the one half. If you kind of work because you should, you know, of course it's easy, the solution takes values in like C alpha for alpha just below minus a half, but the equation would still be subcritical all the way down to minus one, which is what you get in 4D, right? Um, and so, if you work, so it depends on the topology, right? So the rate really depends very much on the topology. You look at the stronger the topology, the lousier the rate. So if you take a topology, which is very close to the C minus a half topology, then your rate is going to be very close to zero, right? So it's, the rate is going to be epsilon to some tiny power, but that power is essentially going to be like the difference between the exponent of, between minus a half and the whole exponent of the topology that you're looking at. Right? Um, and so, so you could work in a topology which is like a C alpha with alpha close to minus one, uh, which is harder because of course, you know, you work in a space which is much too large for your own good somehow, but, um, but then the rate should be better. So, so probably you can get a half if you do that, but that's not a theorem, but you definitely get like epsilon to some very small power. This you get more or less for free. And um, maybe I can ask another thing. So mm -hmm. barring the regularity structures in the analysis of this whole thing, does there somewhere else enter the fact that the principal bundle is a trivial bundle or is the rest except the regularity structures part kind of? doesn't care about that. Um, yeah, I don't think nothing really care. I mean, even the regularity structure doesn't really care about that, right? Because the, at the end of the day, um, you know, you just, you work in the Lie algebra for pretty much anything, right? And so you just, yeah, okay. So you would have a problem if you can't, if you can't choose a global section, then you might, yeah, okay. So if you can't choose a global section, uh, it probably wouldn't really be a problem, but yeah, you would have to sort of patch things together. We didn't do that. But the other part, I mean, the non-regularity structures part. Yeah, I don't, th I don't think it would really make much of a difference. But yeah, I mean, there would be some extra work because you would have to sort of patch things together. But it would probably it would probably not be terribly difficult in this case. 
Thanks. Maybe not, then let us all think and thank Martin again for, uh, for a fantastic lecture course. Can we clap now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just put like three, two, one, go. <laughs> thank you, Martin, very much. Was, uh, okay. Welcome. Yeah, so thanks a lot, Martin. And I think we'll resume in a little bit less than an hour, 58 minutes, if you if you want to join us for the last two lectures. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay.